Ohio, and uh, there was a conference there in town. And my parents convinced me to at least spend one day with them at this conference to find out what it was about. And I said, finally, yes. Well, that was the beginning of the story because at that point, I became so enchanted with and fascinated by the embroidery industry and what I realized was its potential that on Monday, I went in and gave my two weeks notice, packed up my life and moved back home and joined the company took over the embroidery side of it. Within a year, we'd closed down the yarn shop and gone strictly multi-head commercial machines, bought more machines, um, started running a lot more orders, a lot more work, eventually moved the business from its current location to a more industrial location. My folks actually ended up buying an old-fashioned mom-and-pop grocery store where the first floor is the business and then you live upstairs and in another town and we put the embroidery business in downstairs and they lived upstairs and we just never looked back it we went from you know a single needle machine which our first big order had 17 color changes (laughs) and it was a hundred towels, a hundred duffel bags, and a hundred baseball hats with 17 color changes in every single piece. Oh, wow. I did mention single needle, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's a lot. Yeah. So that was the uh, impetus to turn around and order a, at the time, a very innovative six needle machine. So yeah, we've, we've, this is before trimmers when digitizing was still done on the big tablets and digitizers of quality were few and far between and just a whole different world than what people work with now. Everybody has, you know, 12 or 16 needles, has automatic trimmers, has automated digitizing software, has wholesale support, supply sources around every corner, it seems like. So I come from the old school world of embroidery. I never did digitizing on a tablet. I know how to do it, but I never spent the hours to become what I considered to be expert level proficiency. We always hired it out because I was too busy selling and mom was running production and all of that. Eventually, we got to the point where we looked around and the industry was... um, very fractured. There was little cohesiveness in the industry between the manufacturers, the business owners. Um, It was fiercely competitive. There were 60 shops within a one hour drive of mine. And I could not call a single one of them a friend or, or, or peer because it was so fiercely competitive. Wow. And at that point, it occurred to us that there really was no central infrastructure to the industry like other industries I'd been in. And my mom and dad had both been in in, in their careers. And we did some research. We did some national research, actually, with the magazines and the major companies, the suppliers, and the larger embroidery shops, and determined that there truly was a need to create some kind of central community in the industry. And that's what led us to creating what at the time was called Embroidery Network Incorporated. Now it's known as NNEP, the National Network of Embroidery Professionals. And we kind of went along the model of AAA unintentionally, um, but it, it has come to become one of the better analogies that when you own a car and if you're a AAA member and you get stuck, your battery dies, you get stuck on the side of the road, you lock your keys in, you get a flat, you have someone you can call and they will come and help you. We do that for all the independent embroidery business owners. How do I hoop it? How do I back it? Where do I get it? How big should the design be as a monogram on on a shower curtain or a duvet cover? I've never embroidered on a leather backpack before. How do you take apart the golf club covers to embroider them? And are there golf club covers that 
come apart. What thread do I use to make men's monogrammed cuff look really, really good? A thousand and one questions that, you know, individually we were all answering and there was no collective knowledge base. And that just needed to be dealt with. So we became the knowledge base. And so members can call in or email in or get online and go into the members only area and ask those questions and get those answers without having to make the expensive mistakes of learning from their own experiences. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So we've been a fly on the wall of, you know, thousands of businesses for over 20 years now. So somebody somewhere has been there, done that, figured it out and is part of the community that's interested in helping other people figure it out without having to make, take the long way. Sure. And we've also partnered with a lot of the industry suppliers so that as a member, collectively, we represent a goodly chunk of the business, the industry. There's you know 20,000 businesses doing just shy of $7 billion in annual sales in commercial embroidery business owners. And half of them are home based. Is that is that less so, an annual aggregate number? Uh huh. Oh wow. Okay. So you think about three and a half billion dollars. You know, if you just apply the easy fifty percent of half of these businesses are home based, and half of the total business being done is coming through those home based businesses. People tend to write off these home embroidery business owners as crafters and hobbyists, but they're cranking out three billion dollars in work annually. That's a lot. And we we recognize that that was worthy of attention. So we have put in place supplier discounts where, as a member, you're able to get case pricing, even if you're a small home-based business, if you are a legitimate business, collecting sales tax, buying wholesale, and doing it all as a business, then you should have a le more level playing field than being considered a hobby crafter. You, you know, you're no different than a retail storefront as far as what you should be able to buy as your blank goods. So we brought that layer into the NNEP membership as one of the big benefits that you, you're you taken seriously as a business owner, no matter your location. And that's been a game changer for a lot of our members. And the mastermind, the thing you're looking at right there, that's that's been amazing. That's some online member forum where members can post questions, ask, get feedback, call out for help and pretty much 24 seven, there's somebody online that will get back in there and answer. I've seen member to member exchanges where somebody ran out of thread and the pickup was in three hours. Another yep. member met them halfway in a car and brought them the right thread because the company they buy from, there's no way it would have gotten there before tomorrow, wow. even if they overnighted it. So we've had members meet part way, hand off orders because somebody's machine was down. We've had people bring thread or backing or hoops to each other. We've had, you know, machines go down and the software's got a funky little, you know, hiccup in it. And it's the middle of the night and they've got to get this order done for a wedding. This one happened to be a wedding dress that was getting customized. And another member got on the phone with them and they actually set up a little Skype call and could see what the other guy was dealing with enough to be able to troubleshoot it over the phone. And they were able to complete the job in time for the wedding. So, you know, yes, we're all independent business owners doing our thing, but we're in a community of other business owners that are equally interested in success and collectively we can reach that success. Um, with the accelerant of community. And that's 
really what NNEP's bottom line is, is there is a supportive community and access to information and resources for every independent business owner in this industry. That's phenomenal. And so, Jennifer, did you have you transitioned mostly to just running the NNEP or working in the NNEP, or do you guys still maintain your embroidery business as well? As the NNEP gained momentum, it became obvious that if I took an order that I was competing with my members, so there got to be a point of conflict of interest that was uncomfortable for us. We didn't feel that was um, fair or appropriate. So we actually chopped up our customer base and sold it off to various who were then now members of NNEP, and we hand-delivered huge sections of our customer base because we were almost a half a million dollars in the retail embroidery business. So actually, we were a little over. So we took different subsets of those customer profiles and hand transitioned them over to a new embroidery professional and we stopped producing work for sale. Now, do I still own embroidery equipment? Yeah, once you have one, you always have one. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a sublimation and a cutter and a laser engraver and an ornament printer and a heat press. And <laughs> you know, wow. Once you have all these things, it's really hard to imagine living without it. You almost have like a screen printer or something. <laughs> yeah, we did. We never actually owned screen printing equipment, um, but I had a friend that owned a business just a few blocks down from us. So there were many, many nights that I was pulling squeegees to get an order done. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I did his embroidery. He did our screen, and there were times when it was, you know, jammed up. So he was either up at our place folding and packing, or I was down at his place pulling squeegees. So, in fact, we're still good friends to this day. Wow, embroidery so. really provides a lot of education. This uh, Embroidery Mart event has a lot going on, it looks like, as far as even machine maintenance, and there's a lot. Yeah, we, we really try to make that an event for um, business owners that are ready to take their business to the next level. And the, the fellow that's teaching the maintenance class and the hooping embroidery and all of that, hats, um, he really breaks it down to the, to the, to the basic level so that when you go home, you actually can apply. That's my objective with all the classes. You need to be able to go home and apply it without having to purchase anything. They have to actually truly teach you something. It's not a sales platform. So that, that to me is how I challenge each of our speakers every event saying, you know, when they walk out of your classroom, they should have knowledge and skill that they could use immediately in their business to move them forward. Wow. That's and our instructors are very um, motivated to, they're just those kind of teachers that they really want you to go home and do better, make more, you know, elevate your game. And that's, that's really cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, let, tell, tell us a little bit more, like, as far as like the NNEP and like the schedule, like how many events does the NNEP usually run every year? This year we tried three. We had one in Atlanta earlier in the year, and then we have Nashville coming up a month from this week, and we have Indianapolis coming up in two months in mid-July. And they are trade shows. There are free classes offered during the shows. We offer a special, more in-depth workshop the day before the show. So there's an Embroidery 101 How to Get Started in the Industry workshop as well as how to do everything with a heat press, which I think is the second tool you buy, second piece of equipment that any embroidery business owner would benefit from because it, it, it's a side-by-side -side cash register next to your embroidery machine. So um, we really provide a deeper dive for how to set up your embroidery business and then how to amplify it with the addition of a heat press and then we also have partnered with Lee Caraselli Barnes of Balboa Threadworks, and she is doing a deep dive three-day digitizing class right after our show in Nashville. So not only at our event 
Do we try to provide access to all the suppliers, supplies, products, blanks, software, and equipment, machines? We also try to provide a deeper experience of learning so that way, if you're going to make the commitment and the effort to be there, that you are able to maximize the time you spend away from your business. And in fact, I teach the people that are coming to Embroidery Mart how to get their customers to ask them to close their shop for three days or two days to come to the show. Because so many people, that's what we, they tell us, oh, there's no way I could afford to you know, shut down for two days and come to a, an industry trade show, whether it's an Embroidery Mart or any of the other industry shows that, you know, oh, I can't close. And in reality, the opposite is true. If you tell your customers that, hey, I am going to get professional training, I'm going to go see the latest trends, find the newest products, look at the newest decoration techniques so that I can bring those back and share them with you as my customer so that you look amazing. Yeah. They, they actually start saying, well, when's your next show? Because when you came back from this show, you had new catalogs, you had new design ideas, you had new products, and you were able to, when the customer came up to you and said, okay, well, what's new? You had buckets of ideas that you got from the trade show. So we actually flip the model and start encouraging business owners to tell their customers, hey, in three weeks, we're going to be shut down for three days. What do you want me to look for at the show for you? And start a list of the kinds of products that your customers are interested in, whether it's certain colorways or certain fabrications or certain cuts you know, a new option for a his and her matching polo shirts or, you know, a jacket that would work well for men and women out on the on a road crew or whatever. And then they feel like they're vested in your professional development and that when you come back and follow up with that customer and say, hey, I found this really great new shirt in your blue, I would love to show it to you they're going to set up an appointment without any hard sell at all. Or they'll, or you've found, found something that isn't in their blue, but their blue would look really good on a new color, a new, you know, putty, stone, wheat, whatever, you know, the words all change of colors, but the products evolve and the colorways evolve. So if they're wearing the same colors in their shirts that they had 10 years ago, our fashion palette changes every three months of what's on point, what's in trend. And nobody likes to look like they still are dressing from high school. So the only way to pick up that new, fresh range of options is to go get it and bring back new catalogs with the fresh colorways and the color cards and be able to show your client, well, we can take your logo and put it here in this colorway, and it makes it much more contemporary and modern. So you look like you are at the front of your industry, a leader, rather than somebody that's back in the, you know, 80s. Right. Because how they look reflects how they're perceived. So we always have to be working from the perspective of make them look great to their customers. So that way they can, you know, excel. It's not about me to you. It's about you to them and how I can support that. That's awesome. And so how often do you, do you guys run uh, digitizing workshops? We've partnered with Lee for the last several years. So um, it, it's a real honor to get to work with her in particular. Um, She's actually the person that pioneered the concept of stock designs for embroidery. She was the first person in the industry who said, if I make this design for you, John, customer embroidery person, maybe another embroidery person in another region would want to buy that same dog or horse or flower or whatever and came up with the you know, stock design 
process for digitized embroidery designs. And her, her style of digitizing, they actually named a stitch after her. It's the Balboa stitch. Oh, wow. And that's named after Lee's company. And it's that light fill that gives you lots of texture without lots of, lots of stitch count. And she's an amazing teacher. She, she's forgotten more than most digitizers will ever know. And she is a, a um, passionate teacher. She wants you to get it. And she wants to make sure that anyone who attends her workshop goes out of there with a foundation that they will use for the rest of their professional career. And she delivers. So it, it, many of our attendees have come back and said that was the game changer, being able to take that three-day class. So we're very, very happy to have her yet again in Nashville this year. So she does an amazing job. That's great. Um, and so, I mean, as far as like when you guys take on members, it looks like there's a standard member program. They can log into a membership site. It, the mastermind deal is like a separate thing, right? Or is that part of the whole membership? That's part of their membership. Oh, wow. Okay. They're able to access that as a basic member. We have two levels of membership. We have the independent business owners. They join as a regular member. And then we have our preferred vendors, which are the industry suppliers that are offering an advantage to an NEP member. So if a member and a non-member place the exact same order, the member should see some benefit. It can be reduction in freight. It can be case pricing. It could be, you know, buy two digitized designs, get the third one at a discount. It can be a 5, 10, 15% discount off the published price. Um, stalls, sells, you know, everything, heat press, transfers, designs, digitized, cut appliques. The members get us a, a discount on every single piece of every single order from stalls. And that alone can pay for your membership. That's great. So, yeah, our objective is that you can always save more than it costs you to join every year. And most of our members find that they save the cost of membership, which is only $220. With a, their new membership, there's a $25 initiation fee, which gets them their setup kit. But most members find that they save that back in actual physical discounts within the first three or four months of their membership. So all the savings they realize the rest of the year goes down to increasing their profits at the bottom line. And so is the professional development program something that members can take advantage of, or is that like an extra seminar that they come that's to? An, that's an extra. Um, we started the PDP program, the professional development program, a few years ago when more and more members were saying, hey, how can I distinguish myself apart from the, you know, Susie Homeso hobby embroidery person in my hometown and you know being able to say that I am a NNEP member and I attend professional development and I've reached a professional development level of two three four five whatever they achieve is yet another thing that they can do on their website their business cards their brochures to indicate to their potential customers and their community that they're a legitimate business even when home-based or if they have a retail store. So, it, you know, a hobby person doesn't have things like the NNEP membership logo that they can use or the professional development program that they can use as part of their marketing story to tell their community that, hey, you know, I'm a business and I'm going out and learning and evolving and making sure I'm providing you the latest look, the best quality, the latest trends. So when they come, when, when embroiderers come, when, we, when an embroiderer comes for professional development, how many levels, mm -hmm. generally speaking, do they achieve or work on? Uh, we have people up at level seven now. So it just depends. It's unlimited, truly. If you, you record, like if, if somebody attended this webinar and 
I, and they submitted it for PDP units, I would then reach back to you and say, hey, can you verify that this person attended the webinar to whoever provided the education? It can be online, it can be in, at a live event, it could be at the embroidery mart. We actually have all of the students in the classes sign in to every class they attend. So that way, if they go back and submit the professional development for it, that we can verify they actually participated. And this so is really once effective. this education fee is really cost effective. I mean, it's yeah, uh, it does not it's, like it's very expensive at all. No, it's a lifetime membership, and the thing that's dif different when it's when somebody joins NNEP, their whole company is a member of NNEP. So anybody in the business can reach to us for assistance. When you join the PDP program, that's based on you as an individual. You went to that class. You went to this webinar. You sat and took this training. So you acquired the knowledge. So that's one of the bigger dis differences between the membership and being in the PDP program is one is company-wide and the PDP is based on an individual's, what they've consumed in knowledge. And it's a lifetime membership. Once you become a PDP member, it never goes away. You only accumulate, and it's a lifetime tracking. Wow. And we have pins and everything that they get sent every time they reach a new level. That's interesting. You said people are there's people at level seven, which means they've got seventy units. Pretty yes. Much, or plus. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Some people are very very aggressive about it. Other people come to one mark a year and take four classes, and then they get a, if they submit for the trade show itself, that's worth a unit because they went and met with all these exhibitors and suppliers, and then they attended four classes. So they would be able to submit for five units in the PDP program. So every two trade shows, you could actually move up a level. Wow. That's awesome. And we didn't, we made it not cost prohibitive in order to help support the professional growth. And we thought like, that was... Just from the pictures, it really looks eclectic. Uh, it is. It is. And it's, it's an interesting way to recognize these business owners in a way that is then meaningful to them and helps them with their customers. Sure. I mean, just from like, because I'm, I'm a machine dealer. And so I, I deal mostly like in domestic machinery. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. I sell embroidery machines. I'm a brother, brother person, baby mm -hmm. locked, you know, mm -hmm. I sell pretty much everything. But I mean, it, from most of my bread and butter customers are like, you know, baby boomer females um, in that that range. But really, in this space of commercial embroidery, it seems like it's a much wider range. Of people once you go yeah. into commercial, once you get to the commercial side of things. Yeah, people have the perception that it's women, like you're exactly like you said, the mid range baby boomer women. When in fact, on the commercial side of it, we're 50 50 men and women. Your age demographic, we're a little bit like I'm on the very end of the baby boomer definition i'm a i was born in 65 so i'm at the the very lowest year or the last year of the baby boomer group so there's still a good chunk of people that were born from like 1980 from 65 to 80 that have come into the industry so um we find at the trade shows that our demographic starts in the mid to late 30s as opposed to the 50s and goes up through the 50s and 60s for sure, but it's much more split evenly between men and women. And it's because guys and, you know, guys love machines and these are sexy machines. They're, yeah, they're big, cool machines. And there's many, many guys that come into the industry, you know, because my wife brought me to the show and the guy's the one at five o'clock at the end of the day that we can't get to leave the building <laughs> because he's so enchanted with the embroidery machine or the laser engraver or the digital garment printer or what's being done with the heat press or the sublimation or, you know, it's really cool stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it really, and the machines do a lot now. The technology is really impressive and um, it makes it very attractive to start a home-based business, um, you know, with especially the new technology and the ability to create your own income from home. Um, Absolutely. Very it's local. such a great industry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you guys have like any numbers on like demographics or anything? Or I know you said half of the industry aggregate income is pretty much home based. Um, is yes. that like including like Etsy sellers or people that are kind of moving to selling online? Or is it a lot of it pretty much still just kind of hand to hand combat, kind of local customers kind of stuff? Um, we don't have a way of tracking who's selling on Etsy that's a member because that's not one of the things that they report to us. And it's something we're actually interested in starting to research because um, the, there's a real blurring of the home hobby versus the business. And unfortunately, it turns into a real quicksand because you get into all the folks that are illegally selling licensed designs. Ah, yeah. And, and, or not licensed designs per se, but logoed licensed and products, you know, a Disney design, Mickey Mouse on a baby onesie mm. for sale on Etsy goes against everything Disney believes in, it, as it should. It's not that person's right to make money from that image of Mickey Mouse that belongs to the Disney Corporation. So it, it's, it's a real sticky wicket of how to um, monitor and, and manage that, the wild west of the internet and the authenticity of the designs and the source of them. Yeah. It's, it's a real challenge. So, I mean, every Disney pack you buy, it says right in the paperwork, you may not resell this design. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a bad But you can go it's on Etsy and look for Embroidery Disney and you'll find thousands of products. Absolutely. And and I mean the so, licensing, whether or not they're licensed or not, I mean and the licensing is it's probably expensive. Um, you know, it's probably it, it's the same thing like with the NFL or Yes, it's like all the collegiate, the Greek organizations, the fraternities and sororities, all the professional sports, the collegiate sports. The only thing that has re remained consistently safe is a public school system that is logoed using a professional team's mascot and colors. Like if your local high school is the Lions and it looks like the NFL Lions in the same colors, the NFL is never going to look and go, gosh we don't want you using our stuff. If it's a public school, all bets are off. It's fair game. Right. But if it's a charter school or a travel ball, which is all pub or privately funded, you cannot be the Reds in travel ball or the Raptors. You have to be the rhinoceroses or something. <laughs> And they've, they've drawn a hard line in the sand about private and public funding and whether they'll go after the licensing for it. So like right. this person here, she's, you know, making herself a big old target for Disney. Yep. And that's just, it's just not worth the risk. So a lot of people don't want to let us know that they're doing something on a platform like Etsy because they'd rather be under the radar. But yeah. I can pretty much assure you that all of these things you're seeing here are not legal. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, you can make it for yourself, your family and go to the park. That's that's absolutely copacetic, but you can't make it and sell it. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. It's a, it's a, there's a lot more ability to create and sell at home. And, um, it does create like a different kind of atmosphere with licensing. And, um, as far as like the local people, I mean, the bulk of the business in the embroidery industry, I'm sure is still done, um, you know, out of the home with, uh, local organizations, schools, government organizations. And absolutely by far 75% of the business any embroidery business owner does is within 40 miles of their shop, their business or their home. It's the restaurants, the 
auto mechanics, the drywallers, the planer, uh, the painters, the landscapers, small manufacturing, the guy that owns a small machine shop, a local bakery, you know, the local restaurant uptown, not the national franchises, but, you know, the locally owned entities. Those are by, you know, all the local church and boosters and sports and scouts and, you know, all of that is done locally. Yeah. And that's, that's our bread and butter as an industry is all those local community businesses, organizations, and events that want to, you know, brand that event or that business. They have a need to be identified. And it, I mean, it goes back to the, the simple story that I've, I've told many times that you take a playground full of, you know, 30 kids all running around crazy and tell them, hey, come here and sit down. They're just going to keep going on the monkey bars, right? <laughs> you take exactly. two different dads over to two different benches and you start laying T-shirts down on the bench with a number from 1 to 12 on the back of each t-shirt and this guy has blue t-shirts and this guy has red t-shirts i can guarantee you kids are going to start going over to the benches and saying hey what's this how do i get on the team right and no one had to say a thing sure that's the power of branded and logoed apparel even a group of rambunctious eight-year-olds knows that those T-shirts mean I get to be on a team. Absolutely. And that's how you, that's the power of it. You can take a mishmash group of people and suddenly you make a collective mind, a we. Yeah, it's interesting. Now by too, just a lot putting of people, the same shirt on them. A lot of people are starting to sell on platforms like Facebook Marketplace as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll look at some questions here as we kind of get into the later part of the interview here on the forum. Um, it's really interesting. We're getting a lot of interesting questions. Um, and I, I was on a call with uh, Melanie Coakley from Embroidery FX and she teaches. Oh, I love Melanie and Steve. They're great. They're great. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, and she she's big on logos. She's like logos mm -hmm. are like moneymaker, you know, built my business yep. on it mostly. Um, yep. And it's just, it's, there's such an easy niche right there for so many people. And like you were saying, you were in a market with like 60 competitors or, or something mm -hmm. like that, but so many organizations and businesses need branding. Um, it's it, yeah. there's so many ways to brand too. When you look at embroidery as a branding service, um, it, it really, yeah, you're not up. an embroiderer. You're a marketing expert. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she hammered relationships a lot too. And was like, you know, because kind of the general consensus, uh, we've done like a professional uh, interview like we are with you the last three weeks. And really a lot of a lot of the professionals are saying, you know, you, you don't really need to go out and buy advertising for a no. home based embroidery business. Um, I would agree. It's just not effective. even. It's not there's just not a lot of uh, return on that versus like going to where there's big groups of people. Um, yeah, getting can... involved in your chamber, getting involved in your local community showcase, hosting an open house, even at home where people get to see the machine. They're sexy. Yeah. And people want to order something that then gets made on the machine they saw go. Absolutely. Um, so this is an interesting question. Uh, there's John on the forum is asking, most of my work is dog is dog related. I think is what he meant to say. Does dog trophies for dog shows uh, and embroidery? Facebook is blocking photos because they violate community standards. Uh, no selling of animals. Um, so I imagine that that's a thing where if there's, you know, if you have like your embroidery on an animal or something there, it's something to probably work through with Facebook. Do you have any experience with like Facebook Marketplace yet or people using it or anything like that? Um, if you talk about dog lovers instead of dogs, that you make trophies and things for dog lovers and people that enter dog competitions, be more specific in what your language is, that you're not selling dogs. And it's an it's a, uh, algorithm that's reading your content. 
and okay. deciding to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It's not a human. So talk about awards and things, but, you know, target it towards dog lovers rather than talking about dog shows. Sure. And make it more people, not animal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so uh, here's another good question. Uh, Elizabeth says uh, on the forum, I have a, a huge order from a school that wants ideas for items. One is embroidering on knit beanie caps. Never done embroidery on those. Is it difficult? I want to say yes to a thousand pieces. I don't want to say yes to a thousand pieces if I'm going to curse the whole time. Um, so it sounds like she's maybe getting a big order from a school for beanies um, and is worried about yeah. her ability to do it, do that. Um, all right. Well, first of all, Elizabeth, go, go, go. There's nothing to be afraid of. Beanies are not hard to embroider. They're not hard to hoop. And if you have a single machine doing a thousand of them, I would be cursing. So I, I encourage Elizabeth or anyone in her situation to consider partnering with someone that has higher sewing power, bigger capacity per hour, that they could be making 6, 10, 12, 24 of those beanies in the same amount of time that she's making one, and it will come back at the quality level as if she made it. She makes as much money and can be using her machine to double down and make money on another job. And the trick is, is partnering with a quality contract decorator. And that's, again, one of the many member benefits is we connect you with contract shops that are trustworthy that do not want to steal your customer because you are their customer that their quality is top shelf and the product comes back to you looking exactly as if you had sewn it and there's many 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 reputable contract shops out there ready to support you with the higher sewing power on demand when you need it. So you don't have to own the equipment, but you have that sewing power at your disposal at any time. Wow. Without risk. And there are some shysters out there, no doubt, but we don't affiliate with them. We're only affiliated with shops that I personally will vouch for the fact that you are their customer, not that they have no interest in taking your customer and selling directly to them. That's a lot of service industries, too. It's good to have an organization like the NNEP that can vet different subcontracting practices and things like that. It's very useful. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So Chris Howard. Yeah, then it takes the risk out of it for you. Absolutely. Um, Chris Howard asks, I'd like to know what wholesale companies you use for embroidery supplies. I've just added embroidery to my vinyl business to start uh have been getting the basic supplies from my local store where i bought my machines no products supplies like thread stabilizers and needles uh thanks in advance basically okay so do you think she is asking about thread needles and supplies or is she asking about shirts hats and jackets i think she's asking it looks like it says not products uh supplies. okay so yes it is thread stabilizers and needles yeah she's getting that from her shop it sounds like Okay. Um, there are a couple, there's some really great online resources. Most of them are now, um, it's, it's done online. So like threads, you're going to be buying directly from Madeira or Ganold. Um, the backings are coming from the same sources. And then uh, there's companies like Allstitch and Nmart and they are shipping out box after box after box truckloads of supplies to independent business owners all over the country. And those are the kind of resources that, you know, make a difference for you when you start to really produce a lot of volume. And basically with flats and caps, like there's, there's just supply houses all over the United States that want relationships with embroiderers uh, to supply them with that stuff. Um, Absolutely, and, we, and they're exhibiting at our trade shows. It's yet another reason 
to come to an embroidery mart or any of the other industry shows because you can find all those suppliers that are generally fairly hidden online simply because they don't want a non-business owner, Joe Consumer, you know, the local high school coach to be able to find them and buy from them. Because they're selling wholesale, they want to be behind a layer of invisibility. Right. And so it, it gets hard to find them intentionally, which is, you know, in service of our whole industry as, as us wanting to buy wholesale and then turn around and resell it to our customers. We don't want those people to be frontline and very visible online. Sure. So once you understand the reason why they're invisible, then then it's easier to appreciate what they're trying to do in protection of their relationship with us as apparel decorators. Absolutely. Um, so Sue Reese uh, asked, uh, this is kind of a question it looks like kind of in the form of a statement. She says, I have an order for wool blend black and gray ball caps. Uh, this is my first order for ball caps. First time having trouble finding the cap in two colors next to know mm -hmm. if the cap will stitch out nice now to find a digiti digitizer to do the logo so it will stitch out um i know the rule bottom up center out thanks right for getting the digitizing done in the right way um the uh, and i don't want to sound like a broken record but this is one of the services we do as a member is any member can pick up the phone and call us or keyboard us or jump on the forum or email us and say, hey, I'm looking for a cap that is navy crown gray bill. And we actually have created our own custom sourcing software that lets us go in and search and find the manufacturers that are selling wholesale that have caps with a navy cap and a gray bill. And we then shoot her the name and the phone number and the website. So that kind of service isn't available if you're not connected to the industry in some way like a membership in NNEP. As far as how will it sew, here's a whole little lesson on cap embroidery. Unfortunately, caps are steamed on a metal or a wooden um, form before they're finished, when the, the crown is sewn together, the three seams that turn into the five or six panels, it's then steamed on a wooden block, a form. And then the hat bill and the headband is added. And depending on how big the form is and what the diameter of the circle of the hat band is, it depends on how well it will fit on your cap frame. If the cap is smaller than your cap frame, it's not going to sew well. If it's a lot bigger, it's not going to sew well either. So people find that if you have X brand of machine, that you do better if you use X brand of caps because they fit well Interesting. on the machine. That's very interesting. And so do the manufacturers normally recommend that? Have you found No. That? Okay. They That's do. what we've learned over the years. Interesting. That, you know, if you have a Barrett on or a Tajima or a Melco, I would advise you to, to order the bulk of your caps from this catalog, that catalog, or the other catalog, because the cap frame, the cap driver and the cap frame fit those caps the best. That's very interesting. So another question here, um, and I guess just to touch on the digitizing thing, there are like a million options on digitizers now. Um, oh, everybody thinks they're a digitizer. It's a criminal yeah. offense, in my opinion. And <laughs> you guys, you guys have like a referral library of those of yes. the digitizers, right? The, yes. Okay. Yeah, the digitizers that we work with, we know personally. We've seen their work. We've sewn their work. Um, these guys that call 40 times a week asking if you send out designs for, you know, $5 any size, you know, hey, they're just trying to earn a buck too. But at the end of the day, it's your name that's on that cap in front of your customer and it's got to look good. Yeah. 
And if it looks like garbage and you send it out to your customer, that customer's never coming back. And they'll tell their and, friends. And they'll tell their friends that you don't do good work. So if you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. Bad digitizing always creates bad embroidery every single time. Um, so and so Sandra Tate asked, does anyone use mm -hmm. the software? that automatically syncs your in-store and online orders uh, items inventory. I'm looking to sell online in addition to my in-store craft fairs orders. I uh, want something easy to use. I already use Square for credit card payments, and I know yep. they have this service, but was wondering if any others are out there I should also consider. I'm very excited, but I'm not allowed yet to discuss <laughs> that there is a brand new software solution coming online in Indianapolis. She's actually going to exhibit at our show. That'll be her first public venture that is absolutely designed to solve this situation. It is a entry level software for embroidery business owners to manage their production order flow, inventory, all of it. Nice. And it there there are solutions like that already, but they're built for the half a million and up shops. Okay. They're they're intended for the large volume production facilities and they're priced as such and they're that robust. They offer that many valuable tools and services and built ins and layers and menus that those size shops absolutely need and they're wonderful programs but they're way out of the ballpark for somebody getting started and they never intended to serve that industry at the at the basic level this person that i know has been in the industry for a while and finally said forget it i'm tired of battling all these different systems and she has combined all of the issues that we struggle with into one software solution that is affordable and functional. And she's going to pre premiere it at the trade show in Indianapolis in July. And we're really excited. That's outstanding. But it's not there yet. She's not ready to let me release the information. Yeah, I checked with her. And she's like, no, it. not yet. <laughs> I want it to be perfect. I mean, so just coming, she, from, coming from like a niche industry, because I'm a machine person and our point of sale software um, is is a cloud based software that's integrated, um, allows for website orders, allows for work orders. We run a repair shop. You know, there's all these different niche things um, with industry. You know, that having a having a fully customized point of sale software really nice if somebody comes from that niche industry. Um, because otherwise you do end up with different systems, you know, where you're trying to use different features to accommodate your specialized needs. Uh, so it can be difficult with, with really new yeah. industries. It can be hard. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Um, and so I think that's like pretty much the run of like some of the good questions um, that have kind of popped up here recently. Um, All righty. Do you have anything else you want to talk about with this, Jennifer, as far as like the NADP or upcoming events, anything like that? If you ever feel frustrated that, you know, you just cannot get unstuck, reach out and connect with a community. And, and you have a great community here already in this forum in your Facebook group. And, you know, you're light years ahead of all the people that are not in a group like this because right here you already have a community of people that are interested in working together to help each other you can amplify that community by showing up in person at a live event and i honestly do not care if it's an embroidery mart or an applique this and that or a print wear or a dax or an iss or the impressions expo just get out and put yourself shoulder to shoulder with other people that are speaking your language and living your life because I can guarantee your family, your spouse, unless they work in the business the same hours you do, they really don't understand what you're dealing with. And so by putting yourself shoulder to shoulder with a whole bunch of other apparel decorators, you're leveling up your game 
in such a way that it's going to make it a lot harder for your competition to keep up with you. Yeah, and absolutely. it's the, it's it's the simplest thing you can do to accelerate and differentiate yourself from all the other businesses in your community. That's awesome. That's really good advice. Well, great. Well, thanks for spending time with us, Jennifer. I really appreciate your time uh, and taking time out of your day to do the interview. Uh, Jennifer's in the group, um, you know, so you're, I know you've already like contributed and stuff. And um, we really appreciate that. Of course, if anybody, you know, you catch this recording, we'll be posting it. It'll be like up as an announcement so you can watch the recording again. Um, check out the I love seeing all the work that people are putting up. I love what I'm seeing. Man, there's some amazing stuff for sure. Oh man, there's some really talented, creative folks in your group. It's just embroidery. It's just people get so passionate about what they do. And I mean, just looking at some of these pictures that are uploaded, I really appreciate that. Everybody, when you post your work, um, feel free to do it. You know, post your work and your shop, what your shop looks like, um, you know, finished orders, that sort of thing. It's always great. Yep. We love cheering a success. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jennifer, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we'll try and do this again, if that's all right. Sounds great. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Have a wonderful day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.